according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. King Herod heard of the disciples preaching, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason, these powers are at work in him. But others said, it's Elijah, and others said, it's a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, who I have beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod. And the guests and the king said to the girl, Ask me forever whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? The mother replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to Herod and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oath and for his guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with order to bring John's head he went out and he beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples had heard about it, they came and they took his body and they laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of our Lord. I invite you to be seated and I invite all of the brave children and their escorts <laughs> to come forward. So, I have something in here. What do you think's in here? Adam, what do you think's in here? You wanna make a guess? Pardon? A dinosaur, now a little bit too small for a dinosaur. You're pretty smart. I said You said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Must be my old years, you think? So, what's your favorite ice cream, Nick? What's your favorite ice cream? What's your favorite ice cream? What's your favorite ice cream, Nick? Strawberry. What's your favorite ice cream? Mint chocolate chip. Mint chocolate chip. I have three. Okay. Mint chocolate chip and chocolate. Okay. What's Harper's favorite ice cream? All in. Abby, what's your favorite ice cream? Chocolate. Well, you know what? My favorite is strawberry. And I brought myself some. Hmm. So you know what? I just love this strawberry ice cream. I don't know why anybody would eat chocolate or vanilla. I love strawberry. Can you imagine why anybody would eat chocolate and vanilla, Adam? Because they like it. Yeah. Do you think they're missing out if they just eat strawberry? 
I think so too. I think God has created us so uniquely that we should experience all sorts of stuff. So you know what I brought today? What they call Neapolitan ice cream. So it's a little bit of chocolate, it's a little bit of vanilla, and it's a little bit of strawberry. So I thought we could enjoy all of the different flavors and celebrate that God has made us all unique and together we are complete when we all enjoy all of the celebrations. Okay. There you go. Hold on. I'm coming, sweetheart. Don't go without yours, Nick. <laughs> There's for you, too. So let us pray. Well, they ate ice cream. Let us pray. God, thank you that you have given us so many options in life. Invite us to experience all of life, to give thanks for all of the differences, knowing that we are unified in you, our Christ, who has marked us with the seal of baptism, of water and naming and claim us. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know what? You could give Mr. Adam your empties. And he will take them away for me. Right, Mr. Adam? Thank you, Mr. Adam. Can I give you this, too? You can just throw everything in here, and I'll worry about it later. Okay. Thank you. Grace, peace, and mercy to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior. I know you all are upset that you didn't get ice cream. <laughs> there's some in the, if the sermon is bad, there's some in the freezer. Go help yourself. Let us pray together. God, we give you thanks that you have marked us with the seal of Christ, that you have named and claimed us and in that, we are unified. But we thank you also for the diversity of this world, for the variety of this world, that you invite us to experience so many different things and to enjoy the fullness of your kingdom. God, thank you that we can live in that unity in diversity, through the grace of your Holy Spirit. We pray this prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior. Amen. So I bet you all wonder what goes on in the office. One of the things that went on this Thursday is Kelly and I, beknownst to both of us, were having a small Bible study at the very beginning of the day. And I was sharing with her where I might go with this text as I wondered, where is the good news in beheading? And where does one find the gospel? And she said, oh, I've got a great story for it. So thank you, Kelly, for this story. It's from Ram Das, and he, when he was alive, was an author who's concentrated on spirituality, and this is what he talked about. When you go out into the woods and you look at trees, you see all these different trees. Some of them are bent, some of them are straight, some of them are evergreens, and some of them are whatever. And you look at the tree and you allow it. You wonder why it might be that way. And you sort of understand maybe it didn't get enough light. And so it turned that way. 
We don't get all emotional about it. We allow it and we appreciate the tree. But sometimes what happens, the moment we get by humans, we lose that appreciation. We begin to say, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, you are too much of this, Miss Marcia. Or I begin to say, well, I'm too much of that. Our judgment mind comes in. So what would happen if we practiced turning people in a metaphorically oracle way into trees, which means appreciating each person just the way God created them to be. So as I thought about this text, I wondered if Herodias was able to appreciate John just the way he was as a truth teller of God's law, would there have been a different outcome for John? Would Herodias have learned more about who Jesus really is and the character of God if she was able to accept John and the words he spoke? What opportunities did she lose by carrying a grudge and wanting revenge? And in essence, although she did not order the beheading, she did behead John. Well, we'll never know that. But I began to wonder how do we behead people in our lives? Now, I'm guessing none of you have actually beheaded anyone. Nobody's confessing to beheading. That's a good thing. But I'm wondering, what relationships have we cut off because we don't like the way that person thinks? Or they seem to have a different opinion than we do, and so they're off the Christmas list. We're not listening to them. In essence, we have beheaded them. And I wonder what we miss as we break off those relationships. What learnings could we have grown from if we had been able to appreciate them as the image of God created by God? You know, I wonder, in Ephesians it talks that we are marked with the seal of Christ that we are named and claimed in the waters of baptism, that we are called to live in love. In that state of being, can we appreciate others for the gifts they are? Even if they don't look exactly like us, maybe even talk exactly like us or eat the same foods like us or believe the way we believe and the list goes on? Can we as Christians, marked with that cross of Christ, celebrate and live in unity and diversity? I think for Herodias, there might have been a different outcome for John. And I'm guessing in our lives, there would be a different outcome if we were able to allow the Holy Spirit to invite us into living in unity and diversity. What would we learn if we could listen to the other 
if we could truly hear what the other had to say? How would our lives be enriched and how could we enrich the lives of others if we listen, truly listen to one another, knowing that we have that common core, that unity as marked as children of God? Can we start living that unifying factor? You know, we're all created in God's image. And when God created us, God claimed it good. We are all offered salvation through God's gift of grace, through our Lord and Savior's death and resurrection. If we start at that point, can we accept that some might want different things emphasized? Can we allow each group to share their way that they love one another? Can we accept that we will not agree on everything, but we will listen with an attentive ear and open heart and mind so that together God's kingdom might come and flourish. But I wonder, are we in such a polarized time in our world that unity and diversity is not possible any longer? I wonder if we've forgotten what we've learned in kindergarten. They say in kindergarten, you learn everything you need for life. One of the things we learn in kindergarten is how to share and how to be kind to one another. Is there a place where unity and diversity might be modeled, might thrive, and even flourish? Is St. Matthew's that place? We, as marked with the cross of Christ, can we model, thrive, and flourish the idea of unity and diversity? Can we be like the father and son? As the son prayed right before he was leaving, Father, I pray that they may be one as we are one. Can we be in relationship like the Holy Trinity, interdependent and interconnected? If we start with a unifying factor, being marked with the cross of Christ, can we? Better question, will we? I invite us now to say the prayer that's in the bulletin as we seek God's help to live and model unity and diversity. Triune God, you are the eternal three in one, creator of the universe, the word of salvation, and the life-giving spirit. You are perfect unity and all-embracing diversity. To you be given glory and honor forever. In your image, you have created us for life in community, to live in relationship with you and with one another. As your people, you have called us to live in love, to honor each other, to respect each other, to trust each other, to listen to each other, to hold each other accountable to the gospel, to construe each other's actions in the best possible light. But we know that our relationships with you and all others are too easily become disordered. Too often our brokenness gets in the way of living in love. Relationships are marred by anxiety and tension, by polarization and stubbornness by fear and anger.
by your spirit, lead us to the waters of rebirth. We're remembering your baptism. We may daily rise to new life in Christ. Renew us with your forgiveness, grace, and love. Send us back into the world to witness to the good news of Jesus Christ, to work for reconciliation, to seek justice for all people in our communities, in our nation, and throughout the world. Just as you are the one and holy God, yet three persons, so too are we one church, but many hands and feet. Teach us in our diversity to embrace the unity that we have in Christ Jesus and to live in relationship that reflect your love To you be given glory and honor, now and forever. Amen. May the Holy Spirit give us the power to live in God's unity and in the world's diversity. Amen.